ad70.net, where soon means soon, near means near, and at hand, well, it sure doesn't mean 2,000 years. Joining me in the studio for the second lecture of the 2010 Covenant Creation Conference, Norm Voss, with his lecture called Six Days of Creation. Stay with us. Well, I want to welcome from Sugarland, Texas, Norm Voss. How are you doing this afternoon? Michael, I'm doing great. I'm excited to be here. Well, we are glad to have you, and we just want to say praise God for all this wonderful technology that is uh, just making it possible to bring us all together like this. And your lecture today is called Six Days of Creation. Is there any reason in particular you decided to go with that title? Well, the six days of creation should be self-explanatory. It's uh, I'm going to be talking about Genesis chapter 1 explicitly, and uh, we're going to be fleshing out some ideals in there. Uh, I'm going to tie that in with... Uh, John Walton's uh, precept about the uh, creation of the temple in Genesis 1 is a, in my opinion, is a creation uh, account of the temple of God. And so those six days of creation, we're going to see if we can make the case uh, for that to be established. Okay, well, I will get out of your way and let you do what you do best, my friend. Okay, thank you. Six days of creation. Today, I want to look at Genesis 1 and examine the purpose and some of the intent found within the six days, culminating with the seventh day Sabbath rest. We want to view and flesh out what John Walton has called an ancient Near East temple creation inauguration. We also want to look at the six individual days of creation and determine what correlation they may have to the unfolding of God's temple creation. I will state up front that my premise is that Genesis 1 can be called a temple creation account, but it is a covenant creation account, establishing God's people and not a material universe or physical earth account. I believe that Genesis lays out the entirety of the first heaven and earth that we find under consideration at the end of the Bible in Revelation 21. The first heavens and earth that John sees passing away is found in the entire scope of Genesis 1, and therefore it is an exalted story of God's people from beginning to consummation. Now we see that indeed this is the ending theme found at the conclusion of the six days of creation when the author brings up to the finale. Genesis 2 verse 1 states, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. If this was a temple creation process, then indeed it makes all the sense in the world to declare that God's work of creating his people the host were ready along with him for the eternal Sabbath rest. This mimics the conclusion found in Hebrews 4, in which the Sabbath rest is about to be obtained by the people. Hebrews 4, 4 says, For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Verse 10 says, For he who did enter into his rest, he also rested from his works as God from his own. What we will be looking at is what does each day mean and relate to. I believe that what it relates to is found in scriptures extensively because it is about the establishment of God's people. And if this is true, then we should find that these six days have correlating periods of time that match up throughout the Old Testament story. This brings me to the introduction of Augustine's ideas about the six days and what he believed they represented it. I'm going to read an excerpt from one of Augustine's writings detailing his thoughts on Genesis 1's days. Augustine was a significant thinker for his age, and he was still close enough to some of the earliest Hebrew ideas that apparently there were remnants of them still about in his time. However, we know that Augustine was a futurist. 
And so the understanding of the consummated parousia eluded him and most others for centuries to come. Here is what he had to say. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. Thence, down to the time in which we are now living, are six ages. This being the sixth, as you have often heard and know. The first age is reckoned from Adam to Noah. The second age from Noah to Abraham. The third from Abraham to David. The fourth from David to the carrying away into Babylon. The fifth from the carrying away into Babylon to John the Baptist. The sixth from John the Baptist to the end of the world. Folks, what I have just read to you is simply this. Augustine was presenting that the days of Genesis were prophetic ages, detailing the biblical story of the beginning of Israel with Adam until Christ, the Messiah, arrived. What we preterists may find amusing is that just like our current futurist brethren, Augustine thought he was still in the sixth-day millennium period, waiting for its consummating event. However, I digress, because the point of referencing Augustine is to demonstrate this ideal about a figurative application of the days of Genesis still existed three centuries after Christ. Now the question is, where did he appropriate these ideas from? I would suggest from the first Christian writings and from Second Temple Judaism period writings that pointed toward Christ the Messiah, namely Enoch, Jubilees, and the Barnabas epistle as the most prominent ones. <clears throat> Let's take a look at an excerpt from Barnabas and see if there are some ideals that could have come from that letter which was very likely penned somewhere around 70 A.D. Barnabas chapter 15 says, and he says in another place, quoting Barnabas, If my son keeps the Sabbath, then will I cause my mercy to rest upon him. The Sabbath is mentioned at the beginning of the creation, thus, and God made in six days the works of his hand. And he made an end on the seventh day and rested on it and sanctified it. Attend, my children, to the meaning of this expression. He finished in six days. This implieth that the Lord will finish all things in 6,000 years. For a day is with him a thousand years. And he himself testified, saying, Behold, today will be as a thousand years. Therefore, my children, in six days, that is, in 6,000 years, all things will be finished. And he rested on the seventh day. This meaneth, when his son coming again shall destroy the time of the wicked man, and judge the ungodly, and change the sun, and the moon, and the stars, then shall he truly rest on the seventh day. End, that's the end of Barnabas' quote. Folks, this commentary from Barnabas clearly lays out that Genesis 1 was taken as six figurative days, with each one representing the day as a thousand years. Now, all of us that are familiar with Second Peter 3, 8's ears should perk up when we hear the expression, a day is with him a thousand years. We preterists recognize that Peter was referring to the intermediate time that was unfolding concerning the coming parousia. This day to Peter appears to be reflective of the same ideal as it does to Barnabas and Augustine. What I find interesting is that this unique saying is found 200 years before Christ in the book of Jubilees, where it discusses Adam's premature death at age 930 years. Here's what it says, Jubilees 4, 29, and I'm quoting, Thereof Adam died, and he lacked 70 years of 1,000 years, 
for 1,000 years are as one day in the testimony of the heavens. And therefore it was written concerning the tree of knowledge, On the day that ye eat thereof ye shall die. For this reason Adam, he did not complete the years of this day, for he, Adam, died during it. No one can really say that the Jews before Christianity did not have metaphorical understandings for Genesis days, as it's clear that Adam not making the 1,000 years means he died in the 1,000-year day. It's plain and simple. It appears to be the same formula of Barnabas and Augustine, along with Peter, and most probably John in Revelation, with his living and reigning for 1,000 years. The 1,000 years of Barnabas, Peter, Enoch, and John gives impetus to the long-held belief that the earth is only 6,000 years old. Now, I've established how these were understandings that had been in existence for 500 years before Augustine. But more importantly, this appears to be the early Christian perspective of Genesis. It doesn't mean that all Jews understood this concept or accepted it because there were many factions within Judaism at the time of Christ. Some read with strict literal ideals, others with messianic viewpoints. It turns out that the legalistic and literal reading Jews were the ones who had the most difficulty understanding Christ in his parable language and seeing his fulfillment from Old Testament scriptures. The ones who had an eye for the parable were more discerning of the message's fulfillment. Okay. I'm ready to get into the heart and meat of this discussion, which is whether the days of Genesis 1 correspond with Augustine's idea of six Jewish ages or epochs of time, fulfilling a covenant creation account of God's holy temple establishment with man. Let's begin with the opening first two verses of Genesis 1. And I read Genesis 1, verse 1 through 2. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was waste and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. In the beginning is found in two other locations that reference Genesis 1, and that is in J Gospel of John 1, verse 1, and Hebrews 1, verse 10. Both of them are obviously referring that the Old Covenant under consideration was established from the beginning of Genesis 1. The waste and the void description is the condition of the world in which God began his work of creating. If we turn to Jeremiah 4, we see the same state of affairs describing Israel in similar language and conditions that we find in Genesis 1 and 2 without light or man or Adam. This is the wilderness state of existence without light, from a covenant man working a fruitful land. This ideal also can com be compared to the world that Jimmy Stewart experienced in the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Remember when he revisits a world in which he had never been born? Remember the city was dark and without good or light and full of wickedness. This is the imagery that the Genesis author is painting for us in these first two verses. That is the condition in which there is no man, no light bearer, or godly representative to assist God in his dominion of the earth. We will see that this is fully addressed by the time of God's Sabbath rest. Here is the Jeremiah quote. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. And I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord, and by his fierce anger. 
That is the picture of Israel without God's righteous people performing their dominion service. And it is the picture of the world at the beginning of creation in Genesis 1. But let's proceed to the first day. Augustine said the first age is reckoned from Adam to Noah. He's saying the first day corresponds to that period of time. All right. Does the first day correspond to Adam through Noah? Let's see if that scripture picks up on the creation of light out of darkness to illustrate the possible creation of the first Adam to initiate the process of God's covenant people. At the end of the process, we should see the completion of the covenant people. If the first day is the beginning of the old covenant heavens and earth. So be on the lookout in the Sabbath day rest for a recognition that God's heavenly people have been formed completely with no more work needed. <clears throat> Genesis 1 4 says, And God saw that the light was good. God separated the light from the darkness. The first day. Yes, we see in the New Testament and in the Old Testament that the beginning of light out of darkness originated at the beginning and that the pagan world is equated with this darkness. When we go to the genealogy of Adam, we see also that this is the time that the covenant people begin to call upon the name of Yahweh, which is Israel's name for God. This was Israel's people. John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness apprehended it not. Second Corinthians 4, 4 says, in whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, shall not dawn upon them, seeing it is God that saith, Light shall shine out of darkness, who shined in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 5, 8 says, For ye were once darkness, but are now light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. In Genesis 4, 26, Seth also a son was born. And at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Genesis 2, 5 says, Every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. That is the condition that we have before the creation of Adam. There was no man. Just like Jeremiah said, there was no man in that vast wilderness without Augustine understood the first day of creation to correspond to Adam's beginning and not day six as most presume. Adam as the first covenant head of mankind was the beginning of the light bearers called into covenant with God. So that is the essence of the story that corresponds from Genesis 2-4 until Noah's time. It is also clear in the New Testament that light and darkness takes its symbolism from Genesis 1, where there is a clear division and separation of the light from the darkness. <clears throat> Genesis embodies spiritual literature as it was understood by the faithful Hebrew. Genesis day one, with the introduction of the light bearers, corresponds to Adam's period until the flood, when darkness overtakes Adam's offspring, thus bringing God's covenant judgment upon them. Let's now look at day two. Augustine said, The second day was from Noah to Abraham. And Genesis 1, 6 says, And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And I repeat, 
let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. God called the expanse heaven the second day. First, let's try to define how scriptures use the waters. And so by searching scriptures, we find that Revelation says the waters represents peoples, nations, and languages. Can this make sense to describe the story from Noah to Abraham? And I will read Revelation 17, 15. And the angel said to me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. Genesis 10, 32 says, These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations. And of these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. 10, 5 says, By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided into their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families in their nations. Do the waters or the peoples above the expanse represent the line of Shem after Babel? Revelation says that the waters represent peoples, nations, and language, the very issues we find under discussion from Noah until Abraham when the people and the nations were divided. And I repeat again, it says, let the, separate the waters from the waters. Genesis 11 and 9 says, Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. These are the generations of Shem. So, the creation or the separation of the peoples are documented in Genesis 10 and 11 in the table of nations. Babel is surely a religious division of heavenly magnitude. And it has been recognized that Pentecost was the regathering of the nations back into the fold of God in the one language of God through Christ. On another note, we have the first designation of the heavens declared which we preterists recognize is one of the designations for Israel, as they are called the heavens and the earth. I would anticipate that soon we should see the further creation of the earth out of the waters to complete the heavens and the earth of Israel. Let's move into the third day from Abraham to David. Genesis 1.9 says, And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. We have a further separation. We have a dry land that's called earth. And we have the seas, the waters. Well, it didn't take long to see that along with the heavens that the people of the land were separated from the people of the seas. This is exactly how the story is told in Scripture about the development of Israel from Abraham to David. Let's read Exodus chapter 14, verse 15 and 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward, but lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Very similar language. Nehemiah 9 and 11, And thou didst divide the sea before them, so that they went through the midst of the sea, own the dry land, and their persecutors thou threwest into the deeps as a stone into the mighty waters. 
Isaiah 4, 22. Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel, come over this Jordan on dry land. So the creation of Israel is a picture of coming over waters, being established as dry land. Psalm 66, 6 says, He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the flood on foot. Jonah, when he was speaking on the ship, he said unto them, I am a Hebrew. I fear, fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. We have just seen the creation of the heavens and the earth called Israel as a process from Noah to David. Day two is, and three is therefore the full establishment of Israel as the heavens and earth's people and correlates to the language of their Old Testament story. The establishment of Israel begins most specifically with Abraham, and the language related to its establishment is often described in poetic terms as the dry land being born out of the sea, out of the Gentile waters. The period from Abraham to David is considered an age of beginnings. The language of day three surely appears to represent the language in the Old Testament that corresponds with God's establishing his covenant people. Israel is thus known as the people of the land, and the Gentiles are known as the sea. And so we see a clear delineation here on day three with a further process of establishing the people of God and illustrates God's ongoing work in progress of constructing his holy temple. The establishment of the seas in this first heavens and earth would ultimately find its dismissal in the new heavens and earth. The sea represented the Gentile peoples, which found no covenant existence in the period of this first dispensation under law. No more would there be a division or wall of separation between the people, because in the new heavens and earth there is no more sea. Isaiah 60 verses 1 through 5 explains, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about, and see, all they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Thy sons shall come from afar, and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Then thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. Next, we have plants and fruits and seeds, which makes sense from understanding of parable language. When the light bearers establish, with the light bearers established, and with its dry land, then fruit can be produced where once there was a dry wilderness with no man to till the ground. And it said in Genesis, let the earth sprout vegetation plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And that's the end of the third day. Let's move on into the fourth day, which is from David to the carrying away into Babylon. And it says, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And God made the two great lights, 
the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness the fourth day. The first temple era sees the establishment of times and seasons corresponding with the usage of the sun and moon to establish feasts and celebrations. In the final temple, we see that there is no need for the sun and moon, as the lamp is the light. John Walton describes much of the creative process going on in Genesis 1 as functional creations. A functional creation is an assignment by God for functional use. This functional creation is clear here with the assignment of the sun and the moon for determining signs and seasons and festivals and days and years. These were important if we look, read the book of Jubilees or Enoch concerning the luminaries and the recording of day and night in the law. But in the new heavens, there will be no night there to measure. Revelation 21, 22, and 3 says, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. And verse 25 says, And its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. The book of Enoch speaks about the book of the heavenly luminaries, the sun and the moon and their purposes for festivals and seasons, and this is what it says. This is the book of the courses of the luminaries of the heaven, the relations of each according to their classes, their dominion, and their seasons according to their names and places of origin and according to their months. And he showed me all their laws exactly as they are and how it is with regard to all the years of the world and unto eternity. Till, and listen to this, get the power of this, till the new creation is accomplished, which dureth till eternity. The book of Enoch is saying that these heavenly luminaries will not be needed in the new creation. Paul tells his believers, do not be wrapped up in the Sabbath of moon and seasons. Do not get involved in those. But let's move on now to the fifth day. That's Augustine says it's from the carrying away into Babylon to John the Baptist. Let's read and see as it says. God said, let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, in every winged bird according to its kind. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. The swarms of living creatures <clears throat> corresponds with Ezekiel 47 in which the peoples of the known world have been bought, brought into contact with the people of God through the exile of the ten tribes and then finally Judah living and sharing their ways with the kings and peoples of Babylon and Assyria. The sea creatures are the Gentiles and specifically the great sea monster are the rulers of those nations such as Pharaoh of Egypt and Assyria and Greece. God is the God of all peoples and kings as illustrated time and again in the Old Testament when judgment is declared on them because they did not acknowledge that God had established them. Let's read Ezekiel 47. 
portion from 7 verse 2 through verse 12. Now, when I had returned, behold, upon the bank of the river were very many trees on the one side and on the other. And you must remember that Ezekiel 47 is the story of the water flowing from the temple, the one river of life. We'll pick up again here in verse 8. Then he said unto me, These waters issue forward toward the eastern region and shall go down into the Arabah, and they shall go towards the sea. Into the sea shall the waters go, which were made to issue forth. The waters shall be healed, and it shall come to pass that every living creature which swarmeth in every place, whether the rivers shall come, shall live. And there shall be a great multitude of fish, for these waters are come thither, and the waters of the sea shall be healed, and everything shall live, whithersoever the river cometh. And it shall come to pass that fishers shall stand by it. And it shall be a place for the spreading of nets, and their fish shall be after their kinds, as the fish of the great sea, exceedingly many of them. And by the river, upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side shall grow every tree for food, whose leaf shall not wither, neither shall the fruit thereof fail. It shall bring forth new fruit every month, because the waters thereof issue out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for food, and the leaf thereof for healing. Folks, this is the water flowing from the temple into the sea, producing living creatures that shall fully live. And there shall be a gathering and spreading of nets. Daniel and Ezekiel described the kings of Assyria, Egypt, and Babylon as great trees. In contrast to the trees described here, they are, but they are established by God. These trees were to protect the people in their dominion, but each of these trees fell, leaving the creatures, the peoples, without. This is contrasted above to the living water of the Messianic temple water that will not fail and brings life and healing. Daniel 2, 37 and 38 says, to King Neb, you, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom and the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he has given, whenever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, making rule over them all, you are the head of gold. <clears throat> but in chapter 4, verse 14, he says and proclaims loud and says, Chop down the tree, lop off its branches, strip off its leaves, and scatter its fruit. Let the beast flee from under it, and the birds from its branches. This is the complete opposite of what the healing waters of Ezekiel 47 are to do. Verse 21 says, continues, And whose leaves were beautiful, and its fruit was abundant, and in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field found shade, and whose branch the birds of the heavens lived. That was the ideal of King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, but it, he did not leave up to his expectation, and it was chopped down. Also, the picture of the fishermen casting nets is an important motif of the apostles as fishers of men in the New Testament. John chapter 21 says, Christ says to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you shall find. They cast therefore of, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. But the other disciple came into the little boat, dragging the net full of fishes. And Jesus said, Bring of the fish which ye have now taken. And Simeon Peter therefore of went up, and he drew the net to land full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, the net was not rent. The 153 is an interesting number that's used there. The reason it's interesting is that David made a mistake. He did a census of the Gentiles that lived in his dominion. He had them counted. Joab did not want them to be counted, but he did it anyway. How many did he count in his land, in his dominion? He counted 
153,000. 600. Six being the number of man. And we have here the fishes, a great many fishes of 153. Do you see the connection? Do we maybe have an idea now why the early Gentile Christians adopted the sign of the fish as representative of them? But let's spend a little more time with these living creatures found here in Ezekiel 47 who are going to live. We see that they are indeed established in Genesis 1, day 5, which is the time of the 70-year exile of God's people into the heart of the Gentile world. They are cast, the G people are cast back into the sea, as Jonah might say. The saints were cast into the sea, and during this time, like Jonah's time, they performed a precursor of what will happen from Pentecost to the parousia. That is, they will convert and influence some of the Gentiles, such as King Neb and King Cyrus. Next, the great sea monsters are identified also here in Ezekiel and are very similar to the beast from the sea in Daniel 7. We see fulfilled in Revelation where the beast and the monster of the sea, along with the serpent, all meet their final demise. Ezekiel 32 two says, Son of man, raise a lamentation over Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say to him, You consider yourself a lion of the nations. But you are like a dragon, like a monster in the seas. Isaiah 27, 1 says, So oh, in that day, Jehovah, with his hard and great and strong sword, will punish Leviathan, the swift serpent, Leviathan, the crooked serpent. He will slay the monster that is in the sea. However, again, back to the living creatures, as we find them also described in Ezekiel 10, illustrated with four faces of a man, of a lion, of an eagle, and a cherub. Now that is a strange creature indeed. But it reappears in Revelation 4, again as a living creature, except the cherub is replaced with an ox, which represents a priestly position in Hebrew animal symbolism. So, in effect, we have a designation of the living creatures as those who are seeking God, both Gentile animals and Jewish clean animals, but also with covenant man included. Ezekiel ten fourteen says, And every one had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub. The second face was the face of a man. The third face of a lion and the fourth face of an eagle. And the cherubs were lifted up. This is the living creature that I saw by the river of Chabar. Revelation 4, 6 says, And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal and all around the throne. On each side of the throne are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature is like a lion. The second living creature like an ox. The third living creature with the face of a man. The fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And when the living creatures shall give glory and honor and thanks to him that sitteth on the throne and to him that liveth forever and ever. These living creatures that first appear in Genesis day five are also designated as attributes of Adam and of the animals in Genesis two and later on. Genesis 2, 7 says, The Lord God formed the man from, of dust from the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Now, Genesis 2, 19 says, Out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man, Adam, to see what he would call them. And whatever the man Adam called every living creature, that was its name. But let's turn over to Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44 through 47. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves before, therefore, and be holy. For I am holy. You shall not defile yourselves with any swarming thing that crawls on the ground. For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. This is the law about beast 
and bird and every living creature that moves through the waters and every creature that swarms on the ground to make a distinction between the unclean and the clean and between the living creature that may be eaten and the living creature that may not be eaten. Wow. What do we do with that language? Well, let's turn over here to Peter. Ultimately, we know that Peter was told to kill and eat these unclean creatures in Acts 10's vision, which symbolically represents the end of a covenant distinction between clean and unclean, or Jew and Gentile peoples. This is a mystical understanding that the Jews developed in telling this story, but is not one that is always easily grasped in its entire covenant nuance. In the new spiritual kingdom, all these old covenant designations would pass into oblivion. We see in Isaiah 11 that the day of the Messiah will bring about the time when the clean and unclean animals will lie down together at rest. Also, Hosea prophesied that Israel and Judah will come into covenant with these various animals and lie down together just as occurred with Peter. Hosea 2.18 reads, And I will make for them, Judah and Israel, a covenant on that day with the beast of the field, the birds of the heavens, the creeping things of the ground, and I will abolish the bow and the sword and the war from the land, and I will make you lie down in safety. And 11, Isaiah 11.1 1 says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And verse 6 says, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Acts 10. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. The important story, in my opinion, to glean from the fifth day is that it was a movement toward all men becoming more acquainted with God through Israel's dispersion, dispersion to prep the rest of humanity that surrounded Israel to become fruitful receptacles for the coming Messiah. This would be accomplished through his body, the church, moving within the sea and bringing healing to the living creatures as Ezekiel 47 states, and as I might add, Revelation 22, 1 also states. <clears throat> However, I believe it is time to move into the climatic sixth day, according to Augustine. Augustine saw the six water jars filled with water at the Cana wedding as representative of Christ, fulfilling the sixth days of creation. His taking those six empty jars representing the old covenant demonstrated what had been going on from the first day of Genesis because they were empty and had run their course. He was there to fill them miraculously with new wine representing the coming consummation with the concluding marriage. The sixth day. Augustine says, from John the Baptist to the end of the world. Moreover, and he, Augustine goes on to say, moreover, God made man after his own image on the sixth day, because in this sixth age is manifested the renewing of our mind through the gospel, after the image of him who created us. Remember, Romans chapter 8, how we need to have the mind of the spirit. We cannot have the mind of the flesh. So there's a renewing of the mind from one age to the next. 
Christ gives the Jews a reminder that God indeed was still working and had not entered his Sabbath rest in John 5. The process had not yet been completed. Been completed. <clears throat> and so Christ told them that the night was about to come when no man can work. Paul later reminds us in Romans 12 that the night, though, was now far spent, and the new Sabbath day rest was at hand. Here's a quote from Jesus in John 5, 17. Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. God had not entered his Sabbath rest. He never entered it until his works were going to be completed. But now for the most important day, when God said, let us make man in our image, we have already spoken about the living creatures, but they are in view again now in the final consummating day, along with the atoms, when God has plans for them to sustain his likeness and image. It is very important to understand the distinction between likeness and image in Hebrew terminology. Image is a fuller and richer understanding of a representative view of someone than the likeness facade signifies. The likeness attribute is what the first Adam begins with in his genealogy of Genesis 5, 1 to 3. He passed on this covenant image of his likeness to his progeny, Seth, whom all covenant people would follow with until Christ Paul lays out the difference in 1 Corinthians 15 when he explains Adam's covenant nature as the natural and earthy man who is indeed first, yet he is followed by the second Adam who is the spiritual image of God. 1 Corinthians 15:49 says, And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Genesis 1, 24 to 31, I will read. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. The sixth day full creation of covenant man in God's image is fulfilled only through Christ, death and resurrection on the cross, raising us from Adam's lesser likeness to Christ's full godly image. <clears throat> Colossians 3, 9, 10 says, Seeing that you have put off the old self, the old law with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. It's Second Corinthians three seventeen eighteen 18 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and we all are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Now in the sixth day, we get into the covenant dominion command to fill the earth and to have dominion over it. This is reaffirmed after the flood account in Genesis 9 and more explicitly in Daniel 7. In the prophecy concerning the defeat of the final beast from the sea and the turning over the dominion to the saints of the Most High. Of course, that is speaking of what is going on in Revelation 20 and 22, in which the beast is cast into the pit, and the faithful enter into the new Jerusalem, arrayed in new clothes. This all happens after the gospel message is taken to the world by the apostle and fellow members of the body of Christ. And Genesis 1.28 says, 
God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now here is the Daniel prophecy, 7, verses 26 and 27. But the court shall sit in judgment, and his, the beast, dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high their kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey them do you get the power of this message the beast in his dominion has been removed from him and given to the saints of the Most High, the body of Christ. Genesis 129-30 says, <clears throat> And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heaven, to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. <clears throat> Christ told the parable of the small seed that is sown in the ground and would rise to become the greatest of garden plants or trees. The birds of the heavens denoting the spiritual realm of the coming king would find the rest in the branches. <clears throat> First Corinthians fifteen thirty seven says, And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but it's a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. Matthew thirteen thirty one and thirty two says, Another parable set he before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a grain of mustard seed, which a man took, and he sowed it in his field, which indeed is less than all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs, and become a tree, so that the birds of the heavens come and lodge in the branches thereof. Matthew 13 finds its origination from Ezekiel 17, in which a tender twig will be cut off and planted on the mountain, and is in contrast to the garden trees that Ezekiel goes on to tell about, whom all meet their demise, and could not sustain the animals and the birds that rested in their boughs. These great tree nations, like Assyria, would become like King Neb's great tree, and all fall, because they usurp God's people by not feeding them properly. In the new covenant spiritual kingdom, in Revelation 22, the river of life would have trees that provide food and healing for the nations, just as prophesied and described above in Ezekiel 47. They will not fail. They will always be there month after month, year after year. No signs or moon or seasons will disturb them. We are drawing near to the end when the night is far spent and is turning to the eternal day with no night. And so God looks around and he considers his creation. His previous observation about the former work being good is now changed and is claimed to be very good. The work is accomplished, and there is daylight ahead when this heavenly creation week is about to be celebrated. And God sits on his throne looking over the works of his hand of creation. This construction week is now complete of this temple. Genesis 1, 31 says, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Paul tells us in Romans that the night is far spent, and the day is at hand. The works of the law are now relegated to outer darkness as the light of day approaches. Romans 13.11 reads, Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So let us 
cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. There is not much left to say about the seventh day as it is self-explanatory to full preterist. The seventh day reads, Genesis 2, 1 through 3, And the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his works which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day, and he hallowed it, because that in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. The interesting thing about the temple construction is that in the first temple planned by King David and finished by his son Solomon, the Gentiles helped build it. However, they were made slaves by Solomon in doing so. In the second temple, the Gentiles were harshly refused their offer of help to build the temple. In the last temple of the Messiah, those who are far off, the Gentiles, will get to come and help build the temple of the Lord in the uniting of all peoples in God's house. Zechariah six twelve through 15 tells us, and he says to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, for he shall branch out from his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear royal honor, and shall sit and rule on his throne. And there shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. And those who are far off shall come and help to build the temple of the Lord. And ye shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And this shall come to pass if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. In summary, <clears throat> it is important to remember that light bearers were established out of chaos and darkness. And that began the journey of the special people from Adam to Christ. Our ancient first Christians had the apostles to instruct them. And it appears through the Barnabas letter, that they understood all this symbolism when it was explained to them. That was what the Barnabas letter was written for, and it influenced the early church fathers for centuries. However, it lost its preterist influence, and the church turned to a literal futurist reading of Revelation and Genesis. In retrospect, Augustine understood the middle six days pretty well. But he had lost the understanding of the parousia of Revelation and the beginning of Genesis 1. The moral of that story is that just because a person gets a couple of things incorrect doesn't mean he has got all of it wrong. Or just because the church has misunderstood the parousia for nearly 1,900 years doesn't mean it can't be reclaimed. The same holds true for the origin story, as we see the revealing of its mystery language come to light, just as we did 40 years ago when Max King unleashed his book upon the world. Forty years before Max King, my grandfather debated in obscurity beginning around 1930, teaching full preterism. Finally, he decided that the preterist message needed to live on past him. So he put it on his gravestone for all posterity to come and view. Grandfather corresponded with Max in 1971, and six months later the Lord took him, yet he was able to gl get a glimpse of the coming tide of preterism, viewing it from afar after his 40-year sojourn in a dry and desert land, finding few who would listen. I thank you for your time. The lesson is now yours. Norm, I want to uh, thank you for joining us. And let me tell you, that that was absolutely incredible. Now, uh, your grandfather, was his name Moses? <laughs> you would have thought, right? <laughs> right. No, it, my, my grandfather was Clifton Voss. 
Okay, and, and your dad, his name's not Joshua, was it? No, my dad actually was a sad story. Uh, that's oh. another uh, story, and uh, he uh, uh, he turned to atheism, and mm. uh, uh, he uh, left the church, and was uh, uh, so it, it was uh, in between my grandfather and me. We we had we lost the uh, faith for a while. Right now, if you don't mind my asking. Uh, how much of an influence did your grandfather's work have on you? Did you, uh, I mean, he, he did pass away uh, quite a number of years ago. Did did you ever get to hear any of this from him? It's an interesting story, Michael. Uh, uh, 19 years old, when my grandfather told me about this. He brought me in, showed me all the charts that he had worked out. Him and grandmother both, they were both into it. And in that process, it stunned me. I was very young. I was 19 years old. Right. And... But I was fixing to go back east, and I was going to work uh, for that summer. And so I left and really never got to follow up with him for, because grandfather passed away one month later. Mm. Uh, when I came back, I, am, I re, uh, talked to my other grandmother, who I was much closer to, actually, uh, as a spiritual mentor. And she told me, well, yeah, she had heard that grandpa talk about this, and he was crazy. Mm. And she told me, uh, pointed Matthew 24, and she said, look there, uh, find you a good uh, commentary because the uh, Matthew 24 is divided. Well, I found a commentary, and yes, uh, that's what the guy said. For 34 years, I spent wandering in the desert as well uh, until I stumbled upon a, a research that I was doing after reading a, the, a Genesis commentary by Bruce Watke. A Google search turned up an article on the uh, – uh, Noah's flood, and I c- opened it up, and it took me to a site called Preter- uh, uh, Planet Preterist. Hmm. There, I, it was an article by a person by the name of Tim Martin. Uh, the rest is history. Hmm. Uh, I realized when I started reading that that uh, I was originally gone into it because of the Noah's discussion and the flood discussion, but. It led me back into, uh, I started reading uh, Preterist uh, Archive, lots of articles there about uh, Preterism. It, didn't, it took me just a few days to realize that I had stumbled onto what my grandfather had told me uh, 34, 35 years earlier. Uh, I, it, needless to say, Michael, when, I, when that dawned on me, I was shocked because I knew how my grandfather was perceived. Right. He was perceived as crazy, and I knew I was fixing to inherit that same category. Mm. Uh, uh, it was not uh, my life is going to change, and I think all of us preterists understand that feeling. Uh, but I couldn't turn back on it this time because I knew I knew better, and so here we are today. Right, you know, and, and I, I've seen the picture of the uh, of the the headstone, uh, mm-hmm. and and you know it's it's absolutely gorgeous, and the fact that he went to so much effort to make sure that this was going to be around for a long time. And uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a lot to take in when you look at it. And it's like, you know, I can imagine many futurists walking into that cemetery and, and seeing that. And, you know, you kind of wonder, it's like, are, are, are they going to get this? Are they going to understand what it is that they're looking at? But, uh, you know, again, it's just, it's incredible <laughs> to see that somebody like your grandfather put so many years into this and he was not dissuaded by the by the naysayers because you know clearly if even family uh you know kind of rejected some of these ideas i can imagine uh starting as early as back as 1931 in these debates that people were scratching their heads saying well that's not what we hear coming from our southern baptist pulpits Uh, that's absolutely true michael in fact my grandfather uh, for many years had a letter from his father who Mm. told him that he was going to hell (laughs) (laughs) if he didn't change his uh, teachings on that and uh, that letter was uh we eventually lost it, but uh, my uncle was relating that to me uh, for uh, a couple of years ago went before he died and was telling me about much of the story. Right. Now, let me, let me ask you something. You have gathered together a lot of information here and even demonstrated uh, how, how some of the early church fathers held to an understanding that, that wasn't exactly as wooden and as literalistic as uh, we see today. Uh, what, that's, that's correct. Now, how long... Did did it take for you to come to this position? You know, because obviously you came to an understanding of fil- fulfillment first, but then you know there was something a transition that took place maybe through reading what Tim Martin had posted. But to your understanding of the six days of creation in the Book of Genesis is not 
talking about cosmology, but something, uh, as Tim Martin would put it, uh, of functionality. Yeah. Well, you're exactly right there, Michael. Uh, as Tim mentioned earlier today, all of us have been progressing on this uh, uh, search of understanding Genesis. It's a progression. It's a little bit here, a little bit there. You pick up at a time. You'll talk about it. You'll throw it out there. you see if it has merit. It's, people, a lot of people tell you it doesn't have merit, and I, th that's that's to be expected. We're putting out new ideals. It has to be tested. People, uh, uh, if either it will stand or or fall if it's on, from the Lord, and so yes, uh, all of this uh, came about from uh, in actually getting involved with Tim and Jeff early on, and uh, started reading and discussing and uh, researching this and. Uh, gradually coming up with some of these days one of my big uh, breakthroughs was understanding what the image of god was in day six there that one had me buffaloed for such a long time i but there's a key for learning to understand old testament scriptures and that's to go to the new testament to help us define and understand what it's talking about and that's exactly the way i operate i found in the new testament that the image of god was considered to be fulfilled then. That's when I started digging, trying to figure out, well, what's this likeness of God about that? Uh, they say that their man is going to have. Well, I look over on uh, Genesis 5, and that's all that Adam gets is just the likeness. Why didn't he get explained with the image at that time? Because he was the earthy man. He was the lesser representation. It took me a long time to start throwing this stuff out here, and but I owe a lot to uh, Jeff, Tammy, uh, and uh, so many that have uh, helped me with thoughts and tell me when I'm wrong. <laughs> and so we just kind of work through this stuff, and we'll see how, uh, how it uh, plays out. Uh, this is, like Tim says, uh, we don't have it all. I don't, for sure, don't have it all understood. I'm putting it out there. Want it to be tested. If, if, if we'll see how it goes. Right now, you know, in the middle of your your lecture, you had brought up a point about the the four faced man, and in in the book of Daniel, or is it uh -huh. Daniel, with the, the face of a cherub, and then in the uh -huh. book of Revelation, how there is a change to the ox, and the ox as re being relating to the priest uh, class. And you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting as I've been, you know, researching all this stuff as well, looking at and considering, uh, Ezekiel chapter 28. Uh, and you know, it's kind of funny. I flip my Bible open and it opens right to that page almost, <laughs> um, you know, where it's talking about the lamentation for the King of Tyre. And this is a passage that, uh, Greg Beale, GK Beale talks about. And he says, this is, well, in his opinion, this is actually talking about Adam as a uh, representative of a high priest. And mm -hmm. it does say in, in there in Ezekiel 28, you were the anointed cherub, yes. the, the covering one. And it, it is very interesting to look at, you know, when you start seeing this language being used, the anointed cherub, the covering one, you know, it was through the work of that high priest that was doing, uh, at least in some sense, the covering for the people that he was representative of. And um, again, I just got to give you some kudos for uh, just some of the connections that you you were making in this, because that that one in particular just jumped right off the page at me. And I'm really looking forward to as time goes on, the more of these uh, even intertestamental writings that we are looking at to kind of well, give us a well, better understanding. Well, let me throw another little bit more tidbit to you uh, on the ox uh, image uh, issue. Remember the story about King Nebuchadnezzar when he was basically uh, uh, became uh, crazy, right, <laughs> I right. guess if you would say. You know, he, he didn't give God the glory, mm -hmm. and uh, he was struck down, and he's, uh, well, he, he, became, he developed the mind of a beast. Uh, that's basically equating him to a person that's outside God's uh, uh, purview. Right. He he separated himself from God in doing that. But what happened to him when he came to his senses? He studied and he became fed like an ox. Mm. The ox metaphor is used. In other words, when he came to his sex senses, he 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 put on the ox ability instead of the beast. Ability, uh, man. Uh, so that's a, if you go back and read that little tidbit, you'll see that uh, designation there and recognize. But so many times we read those stories and we just think they're pretty and cute stories, but it's telling us a theological point about how that was going to 
what was going on in, uh, on those issues. Right. The uh, the uh, ox or the line that eats uh, straw like the ox. What's that all about? That's the line that becomes like the ox. He eats straw. He eats the plant material. He consumes the material that the a watered land and a fruitful land will give and provide. Mm. Right. Now, you brought up another um, interesting point is that, uh, you know, when these parables that Jesus was speaking were being used, there were some that had, uh, maybe we can use the de- the designation carnal and spiritual eyes. Mm-hmm. Um, eyes in that some people did understand and some didn't. And, you know, just between that and again, with this discussion of uh, looking to, for example, Josephus for his understanding of uh, the Genesis account, the six days of creation, was it talking about literal cosmological creation or was it talking about something, you know, something greater, something covenantal? And it is interesting to to think that he was a trained Pharisee, a priest, and he was somebody that had the same, uh, possibly had the same disposition as these guys that didn't understand the parables that Jesus was speaking. I think that's absolutely what is happening. Second Temple uh, Judaism is rife with, uh, starting with Hosea, a very strict pharisaical development of uh, the rulers of uh, of the Jews and their priesthood. They, They weren't Become, they did not become good shepherds because they were so tuned in to the law and the strictness of it. Right. They be, and they weren't ready to be able to read and understand with the grace and the uh, openness when Christ came. And not all of them. Nicodemus seems to have came around. Uh, so, you know, that's not categorical for everybody. But it is a mindset that... And I think it's a mindset for us to, and we're all aware that uh, of it as preterists, that if you have a literal t- a tendency to read the Bible literally, it, you have to fight through it harder to to get it. it these aha moments don't come to you until you start embracing some of this uh, imagery and learning to grasp it. It's a it's a it's a endeavor though that each person has to move through uh, because of our upbringing. And it's it's a gradual movement and learning how to do that. Okay. And, and, you know, again, I see su- such a strong correlation between what you were uh, speaking about here in the six days of creation with what uh, Timothy King, who was supposed to be uh, with us this afternoon, um, but because of circumstances he was unable to, um, you know, where he goes through the early chapters of the Gospel of John and, and shows the demonstrates the, the six days of creation going on there with mm-hmm. the new creation. Uh, uh, it's just such a tragedy. I, I, I have trouble even uh, bearing thinking the, uh, the burden that this family has ha- had to bear. Uh, uh, but yes, uh, Tim K- uh, King's uh, writings have uh, been of immense help to uh, all of us. Okay, and that's exactly what I was going to be asking you about. That it was, you know, how much influence did the the work of Timothy King uh, regarding uh, John chapters one and two? How much did that actually have? on the direction that you went it has some uh direction it helped get me started but i haven't read as much of tim lately and i uh, the reason i was looking so forward to it but uh because i didn't really ever get a lot of his uh, uh writings except some of the basics of it mm-hmm. and so i knew and Tim Martin had told me about it and explained it to me as well so i had gathered that information and then it had an influence but it was uh, it was not as probably as uh, strong as I, I wish it could have been, because there are things that I'm sh- I know I need to understand from Tim that uh, that would help me even more. Right. Is there anything else? I I honestly I, I kind of lost track of the chat room during this lecture because uh, you know I was following with your notes. There was so much information there. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to to cover? Any thoughts and uh, possibly. Uh, anything future-wise you're you're thinking about going any roads you're going down regarding this topic? Well, th- what I wanted to do in laying it out the six days of creation is really to get it out there. I, I've been putting bits and pieces of it out there over the years, and I just felt like it, I needed to get it forth out there in a uh, kind of a one-shot deal. And somebody may uh, tune into that. Uh, somebody may not. And uh, let let them work on it. What I will pr- probably do is probably will continue with my examination of uh, ge- the rest of Genesis. I f- 
I feel very comfortable with Genesis 2, 3, and 4. What I have more difficulty with is uh, the flood event. It's right. because I haven't really moved into all the symbolism in that. I haven't broken it down. I haven't examined it in depth uh, from this mindset. Uh, and so that's a work that I, I, I would want to do. And I want to explore more the Babel uh, examination of uh, what went on with Babel. I alluded to the part of it today uh, on it was the division of the, uh, the nations. Uh, and it was the separation of the people. Uh, they're going their separate ways. But there's more into that than that because Babel is really – as I said in my talk, redefined at Pentecost when we have the return to the one language of Christ, the one, uh, the one lip. It's it's a long discussion, but there that's a very interesting discussion. But the flood account and all those, those uh, chapters six, seven, eight, and nine. Uh, there's an amazing amount in there that will keep me busy for a long time. To be honest with you. <laughs> Right. Uh, so that's probably going to be one of my focuses, but uh, you know, it just that's probably the the more difficult area of Genesis one that I find. Okay. Or Genesis one through eleven. Yeah. Now Genesis one through eleven, I, I think anybody can see how different in in style of writing it is from the rest of the book of Genesis. Uh, yes. And and it's so it is something that I think we need to you know, it, it's a field that we need to tread into lightly because. Uh, you know, it is something that is so different. Uh, it is set in a different place and time. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, real quick, Norm, before uh -huh. we before we get going, uh, is there any way somebody can get a hold of you? Do you have an email address that people can send if they have any questions? Well, sure. They can reach me at Norm B V. That's N O R M B as in boy, V as in Victor, at Yahoo dot com. That's Norm B V at yahoo.com if you want to uh, email me anything. And I do hang out at a couple of the uh, forums as well. Mostly uh, Death is Defeated. I uh, interface there uh, most most often uh, in places. But, uh, you know, if anybody was interested in uh, re questioning, uh, sending me a question or asking me something, I'd be glad to, uh, glad to discuss it with them there. All righty, Norm. Thank you for joining us. We will see you again shortly. Michael, thank you for uh, hosting me. I appreciate it so much, brother. All righty. God bless. And this is the 2010 Covenant Creation Conference heard on AD70.net. That was Norm Voss joining us from Sugarland, Texas with his lecture. It's called The Six Days of Creation. AD70.net, where soon means soon, near means near, and at hand, well, it sure doesn't mean 2,000 years.